Hey, everybody, it's Kathleen Jasper. I'm so happy to be here with you today. We are live for the Praxis Core webinar. I am going to be going through the entire test today with you, and we will be going over structure, practice problems, how to think like a test maker, and all of that. So I just started the live. Again, this is for the Praxis Core teacher certification exam. And my name is Kathleen Jasper from KathleenJasper.com. And I have been helping teachers pass their teaching and leadership certification exams for the last 10 years. So I'm going to give everybody a minute to come in to the webinar. We have a lot of people signed up for this webinar. Um, we have, you know, 14 or 1500 people who signed up for the webinar. So let me know in the webinar if you can hear me and see me according to my um, software, everybody can hear and see me, but I always like to check and I like to check and make sure I am live on Facebook, which I am. And let me just check to see if I am live on YouTube, which I am. Okay, great. All right. Looks like people can hear us, see me. All right. Good, good to meet you guys. Let me know in the chat where you're from. I'm out of Florida. It's super hot here today. I know that's not the reality for everybody right now, uh, but it is it is getting steamy out in Florida again. So we're kind of happy about that. It was a little chilly and by chilly, I mean like 50 degrees. So that's a lot for us here. Um, but let me know where you're from in the chat. We had tons of people sign up for this webinar. Like I said before, over 1,400 or 1,500 people. So I'm looking forward to this live. We've got Tennessee, New Jersey, Texas, New Hampshire, Utah, a lot of New Jersey. We, we have a lot of New Jersey people. Welcome, New Jersey. And um, Denver, Virginia, South Carolina, Arkansas. All right. We have people from all over the country, which I love. So I'm really excited. So today we're talking about the Praxis Core webinar. And I just want to make sure that I can see my screen on here. I always use my phone so that I can um, see everything. So that's good. There we go. And we are going to be going over the free practice study guide that you got with this webinar. We're going to be going over the structure of the exam and we're going to be going over, you know, how to think like a test maker and do really well on this exam. Okay. So I always say that think like a test maker. You want to try to find the patterns and the nuances on these exams. Now, obviously I know them a lot more because I study tests, that's my job, but you too can use some of the methods that I use in order to pass your exam, all right? So we will be doing a lot more math today than we usually do because I had some requests for that. And so I'm going to make sure that I hit math and that's going to be at the end. So it's going to be a little bit longer in the math. I have a few more questions we're going to do. Now, when you signed up for this webinar, you received a free study guide and the link. And you will also get, once the webinar is over, you're going to get a follow-up email with a discount code and all of the resources that came with this webinar. My colleague is in the chat. Her name is Yana. She'll be communicating with you guys in the chat. Um, if you have questions, you can ask each other. And uh, Yana will also jump in. We have an offer for code for you for 20% off our products for the Praxis Core. This is um, something that everybody can use. This, this is free. And a lot of people just use our free stuff and pass, which is awesome. But if you'd like a little bit more, we have other resources for you. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. Now today, again, we're doing Praxis Core. This is the pink book. So if you are you went to Amazon and bought it. It's going to be the pink book. Now it says 2021 to 2022. I assure you this book is still good. I wish I hadn't put that on there. Um, there are, it's still valuable. The Praxis Core has not changed since I think 2019. They changed the math in 2019. It has not changed and it's not on the schedule to change. Okay. So just, I know it says 2021 to 2022. Just ignore that. Everything in this book is really good. Um, and we're going to be working from that today. A lot of the questions I pulled for the free study guide come from that paid study guide. Now, if you're watching me on social media and you're like, where do I get that free study guide? There's a link in the description. It'll take you to a sign up page. You just put in your email and you'll receive um, access to the replay link or the live link and you'll receive access to the free study guide. Now, if you are watching me and you didn't have time to download your study guide, don't worry, I'm going to project it on my screen. So you don't have to scramble right now and try to get the study guide. Everything's going to be projected for you. And then you can watch later. You can rewatch this as many times as you want because you'll have access for as long as you need. Okay. All right. So again, Praxis Core, we're going through all three subtests today, reading, uh, writing, and math. The thing about the Praxis Core is that it is considered a basic skills exam. 
And the position of most states is that they want to make sure their teachers have the same skills as a 10th grade student who is trying to graduate in 12th grade. These, these skills in on this test are the same skills a 10th grade student needs to have to graduate. So I know we don't graduate until 12th grade, right? But the skills that are assessed on many of the end of the year exams for students, they're 10th grade level. We want them to be at a 10th grade math level, 10th grade reading, um, <clears throat> 10th grade writing. Some of you even have it in your state. It's like the 10th grade math test, the 10th grade reading test. They have to pass it before they graduate. We have that in Florida. It's the same thing here. They want you to have that same level of skills as a graduating student because their position is if you're going to teach, you need to be at the same level as a high school graduate. Okay. Now I know it's much more complicated than that. Some of you are proficient writers and you're having a hard time passing the writing because it's very nuanced and very specific. Some of you never got the math instruction you really needed as a kid and you're struggling with the math. And it doesn't mean you're not going to be an amazing teacher. It just means we got to focus and we got to really work on the math skills. Now, again, the Praxis Core is like an ACT or an SAT. There's not going to be any teaching scenarios on it. It's not like your elementary education test or your teaching reading test or your early childhood test or your middle school social studies test. Those are subject area exams and those go with the content that you're trying to teach. So if you want to be a middle school social studies teacher, you take the middle school social studies exam that's required by your state. But most people also have to take this test. This is the basic skills test and most teachers are required to take it. Some states have kind of phased it out, but most states um, still require it, okay? Now I see some people are saying they're having a hard time passing math. It's hard especially if you haven't seen the math in a long time, but we're going to go over a lot of it today and I have a lot of resources for you. All right. So really quickly, I want to show you a couple of things before we get started in the presentation. For sure, you can use the free study guide that comes with this today and this video. You can also go to my YouTube channel and look at my Praxis Core videos. Some people use the free stuff and pass. Other people need more support. So let me just show you where to get that. And there's an offer code in the chat for those of you who are attending live. If you'd like the offer code for 20% off, sign up. It's in the description if you're watching me on social media. All right. So let me go ahead and just share my screen really quickly. I'm going to sh show you a couple of things. So um, you can see that this is my website. Under our programs, if you go to Praxis Core, this shows you everything we offer for the Praxis Core. Now, if you need more than one subject area, I recommend getting the full study guide because it's cheaper that way. If you buy them individually, it's more expensive. However, let's say you haven't passed the math. That's the only one you need. You can just buy the math. We offer that for you, okay? If you just need the writing, you can buy just the writing. But if you need more than one content category or more than one subtest, buy the whole thing. It's much less expensive that way. And then we have online courses here for those of you who are having a hard time with that. Now, again, I would buy the full course if it is, if you need more than one um, subject. But if you only need math, just get the math. Now, really quickly, very, very important. The study guide comes with the online course. So if you buy the online course, you do not have to get the study guide also. You just have to buy the online course. It comes with everything. So I see sometimes people buy the book and the course. I got to go in and refund them for the book. Don't buy the book if you're buying the course. You get it all. Now, everything on our um, website is digital. So if you buy this on our website, it's a digital download. Some people want a digital study guide. They want it on their laptop. They want it on their, their device. But if you want a physical copy, you just click this button here. It'll take you to Amazon. Now you can see here, we've got a lot of five-star reviews. This book has done very, very well. You can only buy the full study guide on Amazon. You can't buy individual subtests. But I recommend if you want a physical copy of the book, do not buy the digital and print it. Buy the physical on Amazon. It's much cheaper and it's gonna save your ink, okay? Now we cannot offer um, the discount code on Amazon because Amazon is the publisher. I can only offer discount codes on my website. So if you want the, to use the discount, you have to purchase from the website, okay? Now, again, let me just show you really quickly what the online courses look like. So this is the reading online course. Notice you get um, the study guide here. It's right here. You download it as a PDF. I've got a bunch of videos, and then I go through every practice test question, and they're all here. Um, and then I have a videos 
for every single practice test question, this is one through nine, this is 10 through 20, and I do that for every single test. Same with the writing, let's share this tab. This is what the writing looks like. The writing, you get the writing study guide, and then there are videos where I'm explaining um, there, this is very in depth about grammar. It's got a ton of videos and information. It's just, it's packed full. And then, um, you know, it, I've got the writing here with videos and examples and all of that, how to do that. Okay. And then the math, let's just show you the math really quickly. The math is crazy big. You're going to need some time to get through the math. I have videos explaining everything. And then I go through every single um, practice test. And here's the post test here. I have explanation videos for every question. You can see here, this is one through 10. This is 11 through 20, 21 through 30. I go through every question writing on the screen, like I'm going to do today. Okay. So I just wanted to show you where to get more stuff. And again, you're going to get, um, an offer code that will help you bring down the cost. So it's in the chat if you're live in the webinar now and you're going to get it in a follow-up email. Also, if something happens and your internet goes out or something happens, your kid gets sick, you can't stay for the whole thing, just hit the replay when you get your email. You'll be able to watch this later. So don't stress, it's all good, okay? People are asking me if this is going to help with other tests. Typically, these tests, these basic skills tests that everybody has to take, they're all pretty much the same. One's called the Praxis Core, one's called the General uh, Ed, one's called, you know, whatever Texas uses. They all assess the same skills. If you look at the test specs, it's all the same. And it's the same for high school exams. You know, in math, they're going to assess um, uh, number sense. They're going to assess algebra, geometry, and probability and statistics across every grade level and on these exams. So if you're looking for exact test questions, you're not going to get that. We have no idea what test you're going to get, and we shouldn't know that. But we do cover every single skill. Whenever I write a book, I take the test specs. That becomes my Bible, and I make sure I um, hit every single skill that is in that test spec, because whatever's on the specs is fair game for the test. So I make sure I hit it in a number of ways, especially in the math. I don't just do it with one math problem. I do it with lots of them. So no matter what way you're asked, you're going to get that information, okay? All right. Um, so somebody's asking, once we set up for an online course, can we have, can we use it again and again? When you buy an online course from me, you have it for as long as you need it. We don't do that membership thing. And a lot of people have said I should because it's, I don't know, people make more money that way or whatever, but I just don't feel right making somebody buy more when they need more support. It's like, I'm a public school teacher. I want you to have it as long as you need it. So if you buy an online course, you have it forever for as long as you need it. Now, if you haven't logged in in six months, we archive you because it weighs down our server. But if you want access, you just email us. If it's been a year or six months and you're like, hey, I need access to my online course, we will put you back in there. But if you're logging in, you're staying active, you're good to go, okay? It's just if there's a lull of six months and you haven't logged in, we usually will archive you because it's a lot of people on the server if we don't do that. But you have access for as long as you need, okay? Uh, will this help with New York exams? Yes, yes, it will, okay? Um, if you're taking another exam that's not the Praxis Core, I recommend doing the free stuff first the stuff I'm gonna do with you today and checking out my YouTube channel. And if you're like, yeah, this looks a lot like the test I'm taking, then buy it. But if, if you're doing, taking the Praxis Core and you wanna buy the stuff, definitely buy it, it's aligned. But if you're taking a different test, I would start with the free. And then if you want more, then buy it and, and use the discount code, okay? All right, so here we go. We are doing Praxis Core, three subtests. It's going to be reading, it's going to be writing, and it's going to be math, okay? Now, for the reading section, I'm not going to go over too much on that except a couple of strategies first. The reading is one in which if you're struggling with the reading, you've got to read more. There is no silver bullet for the reading. Um, a lot of people say, well, what can I do? Or they go on Quizlet and they're like, I found a Quizlet for the reading test. Quizlet's not gonna help you get better at reading. Now, someone might be sharing a Quizlet after they took their exam and they might be trying to show the questions that they had or something like that, which is not allowed, just so you know. And, um, but you don't know if you're gonna get those same questions as that person. There are hundreds of test items in an item bank, lots of different passages. You don't know which test you're going to get. So relying on Quizlet is kind of a, I mean, 
you might, you might get the same question as that person, or you might get a totally different exam. So I recommend practicing your reading skills. Now, one thing about reading is the way they assess it on the Praxis Core, the ACT state exams for high school, elementary, middle school kids. That's not the way we read in real life. We are never asked in real life to read a passage and answer questions. Never, never in real life are we asked to identify the main idea. My boss has never come to me and said, hey, Jasper, read this and uh, give me the main idea. Never. Oh, give me the key details. Never. But that is the way it's set up across every single standardized test. And there's really nothing we can do about that. So we've got to just practice, practice, practice. Now, I have lots of pr um, practice uh, passages and questions in my book, but you might be like, I already did all those. What you can do is Google released ACT test. ACT releases a test every year and it has um, extra passages, extra reading passages, all right? So there's four on every ACT test and they're big. And if you can do those, you're gonna be fine for the Praxis Core because the ACT is a little bit harder, especially with the reading. You can do the same with SAT. Google released SAT test find the reading that will give you more passages for free and you can keep you know do one passage a night and really analyze your answers why did you get this one wrong why did you pick this one okay that's the first strategy i'm going to get into another strategy you can use in a second but you have to practice your reading and it's hard um a, a lot of people who are they love to read they have a hard time passing this exam my daughter um she's a really good reader but she reads slowly she needs a minute to like understand what's going on. A lot of people do. And so when it's timed, you got to move. So I'm going to show you some ways in just a second to save some time, but you really have to build that muscle. Reading is like running. You can't just sit on the couch all day and go out and run a half marathon or a 5K. You have to get up off the couch, run a mile one day, run 1.5 the next day, then maybe rest, then run a little bit more. And before you know it, you're able to run the 5K. The same with reading. If you haven't read in a month anything and you've just been scrolling TikTok for the last you know, month, like I've been doing lately, all I've been doing is watching TikTok, you are not working that reading muscle. And so when it comes down to having to read, um, you, you're, you're choppy. You'll notice when you go to read something and you haven't read in a while, you're like slow, you're choppy, you're sounding things out. But if you've been reading for like the last week, you're picking, you're moving through that text. So just keep practicing, put TikTok down, stop scrolling. You can find articles on Facebook. You know, there are good news articles on Facebook and other things, but read them. Don't scroll read and that will help you you don't even have to use passages if you don't want to just read everything you can get your hands on informational text literary text just work that muscle okay but let me show you a couple strategies with the reading and again i'm not going to um do the reading with you today because reading on an online uh, webinar from the screen is awful i'm not going to sit here and read the study guide with you but what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you a couple of strategies okay so what we want to do is we want to read the question first okay so what the way it's set up usually is the passage is on the left side and the questions are on the right side now i can't do that in a book i i want it to fill up the whole book so the book is going to look a little bit different um but typically there's like a, a passage you can scroll up and down and then on the right side there are some questions okay let me zoom in here okay I recommend that you go over to the questions and you just briefly read the stem first. Don't read the answer choices. Now, I know in a lot of my other videos, I talk about working backwards, read the answer choices first, not on the reading. The reading's a different strategy. If you were taking a subject area exam where it's all about teaching strategies, that's when I tell you to read the answer choices first, but not on a standardized reading test, okay? For a standardized reading test, like an ACT or a Praxis Core, question first, and let's say there are three questions attached to this. Read all three. You can even jot a little bit down on your scratch paper, just a word or two, just to get the mind going. What is, what is my purpose for reading? Once you've read that, don't try to memorize it. Don't read into it too much. I notice here they're asking me for the main idea. All right, main idea. 
Then I go in and read and I'm better suited because now I know what I'm looking for here. Instead of going, reading this whole thing here, and then reading the question, identify the main idea. Oh, now I got to go back and read the whole thing again, right? If I start with the main idea and I say, oh, they're asking for the main idea. I need to think general here. I need to think overarching message. I'm more suited to do this quickly. Now, another strategy for the main idea. The main idea is an overarching statement about the passage. Don't get too um, specific. Now you can see most expensive movie of its time. Okay. This one says was hugely successful movie and worth the risk. This sounds a much more general. This one's talking about expenses. Um, this one's specific about the director's salary. Sounds too specific for a main idea. The award scene, that sounds too um, specific for a main idea. And the highest grossing movie of the 1990s, that also seems like a specific detail. We are looking for a hugely successful movie and worth the risk. Look how, look how uh, general that is. Now I'll tell you, I've tried this before. I have on practice tests just read when it says main idea, I'll go into the answer choices and just pick the most general statement. And nine times out of 10, I get it right without ever having to read this. Okay. Yes. The movie Titanic was a blockbuster of the 1990s. That's just one sentence. That's not the entire passage. E is out. You know, yeah, it's got, you know, uh, it talks a lot about money, but it also talks about how successful it was, right? It, it swept the Golden Globes, positive reviews. So you have to be careful when you're talking about a main idea question, we want to be very general. Okay. Let's go down here. Here's another one. So which of the following events was instrumental in shaping the success of Helen Keller? Shaping the success of Helen Keller. Now, I don't know yet, but by reading that question first, as I go in, I'm going to be better suited to find that answer more quickly. And I'm just going to set my purpose for reading better. So remember, question stems first. If there are three or four or five questions attached to it, that's okay. Read them. Um, I have a strategy on my YouTube channel for ACT reading as well. If you have students, if you have um, kids taking the ACT, I highly recommend it. I will link it up in the email that's going out to you guys because it's really helpful for ACT. When you're reading for the Praxis Core, it's going to be a little bit different um, because they have more questions with their passages. They have 10 for every passage. On the Praxis, you might have one, two, three, five. It just depends. Some of them, you only have one question per passage, and it'll be a short passage like this. Um, but I'm going to link that up so you can see that strategy as well. It's really good. Okay. So that's how you do that. Now, again, this is just two small passages. This is a free study guide on my... Um, my main study guide, let me just go here and show you what you get. You know, there are full practice tests with, some of them are just paragraphs. On the Praxis Core, you'll have, let me zoom in, you'll have just paragraphs. Others are charts. You will have to read charts. Others are, let me go to a bigger passage. Others are bigger passages like this here. Um, let's see. Some of them you have to pick more than one right answer. These are tough. Now, when you have to pick more than one right answer, you have to get them all correct. There is no partial credit. Okay. There is no partial credit. So we've got bigger passages, smaller passages. Look at this one. This one's much bigger. Um, and so you have two full practice tests with answer explanations. Let me scroll down. Sorry to make you dizzy. Here we go. Lots of detailed answer explanations here telling you why something is correct or incorrect. Definitely check your answers if you have the study guide. And even if you got it correct, read the explanation because it'll help you. All right. So that is the, um, stop sharing. That's the reading. Now I'm not going to read these passages to you because that's just crazy. We're not doing that, but, um, use that strategy and I'm going to hook you up with the ACT reading strategy, which will help you. And if you have your own kids who are trying to take the ACT, it'll help that. And if you're trying to teach high school, I recommend you talking to your kids about this too, because it'll help them. The high school kids are taking ACT and right now it's when ACT amps up. Okay. Kim Hunter, you shared a great strategy that helped me with reading and writing. Awesome. Awesome. Think like a test maker, not a test taker. Yes, Kim. Yes. That's exactly it. Think like a test maker. Notice when I go into that main idea, if I'm, th if I'm thinking like a test taker, I'm starting at the top. I'm reading the whole passage. Then I get to the question. I forgot what I read. I got to go back, read the whole passage again. 
Maybe I answer that question. Then I go to the next question. It's asking me about a character. Oh, I don't know. Got to go back and read the whole thing again. That's a test taker. Now think like a test maker. Questions first. What Work backwards. What are we doing here? Okay, they want to know this. They want to know that. Oh, it's main idea. Let me see if I can eliminate any specifics here. That might help me narrow things down. Just be strategic and, and practice. Don't... <laughs> Don't use that strategy just on test day. Use it in your practice, and that way you're good at it. You know what I mean? When test day comes along, okay? All right. Yes, I love it when people use that saying, think like a test maker, not a test taker. It's so important, okay? All right, so now let's talk about the writing. The writing is broken up into two sections. So you have the grammar, which is like straight up, like where does the period go? Where does the comma go? Is this the right preposition? Um, uh, commas, um, uh, gosh, parallel structure, misplaced modifiers. And a lot of people haven't had explicit grammar instruction their whole lives. Like we did growing up. Uh, but some of the new, you know, new teachers coming in who are a little younger, grammar might not have been taught explicitly. It was sort of taught holistically in the writing process, which has set people up for failure on some of these standardized exams because the grammar is really important. Now, I was an English teacher in high, for high school and I taught explicit grammar, but I don't know if anybody was listening to me. So they usually get glazed over at that point, but I love grammar. Grammar is like a mathematical equation. It's just like math. So if you're one of those people who says, uh, I'm a math brain person, I'm not an English brain person. That's not true. Those statements are not true. We don't just use one side of our brain. It's just that you may like math more. You may have been more successful in math or opposite. You may have been more successful in your English classes rather than math. Um, using those things, those types of conversations with ourselves is not, is not helpful. Okay. All right. So let's have a look at the writing. So we're going to be going over and I'm going to share my screen with you really quickly. We're going to be going over the writing and why is that this should not hang on okay this should be gone okay sorry about that i wanted that little thing gone i didn't want that in the middle of my screen because then you wouldn't be able to see it okay perfect so um, we are talking about all three. We already did this 5713, and we talked about how we want to make sure that we're reading the questions first and that we are being strategic with that and we're practicing our reading. Now we're working on the 5723. All right. This is going to be the writing. Two things for the writing there is the grammar section and the actual essay section. I'm going to go over both and I'm going to do both essays today. Okay. So let's just have a look at a couple of the grammar questions. I pulled a few from your free study guide. Again, access to the free study guide. If you're watching me on social media is in the link in the description, you can put in your name and email and then you'll get it. Um, but I chose a couple of questions here that will help me kind of talk you through a few different, um, uh, scenarios on the test. Okay. So let's have a look at one. Now I'm looking at the answer choices. I always do that just quickly. So I have to pick something that fixes the sentence or I have a choice that there is no error. Now, really quickly thinking like a test maker, a lot of people are afraid of the no error because they think, oh, I'm taking a grammar exam. I got to correct the grammar. Not all the time. Don't be afraid of no error. No error is correct as much of the time as everything else. So th they're kind of distributed evenly throughout the test, you know, A, B, C, D, and E. So don't be afraid of no error. If the sentence is grammatically correct, it's okay. Choose no error. Let's have a look. Aunt Judy was happy to see that my mom was sitting with my sister and me. Okay. This is one that people uh, can, cannot equate the right grammar with how we speak. A lot of people speak by saying, my sister and I, they think Aunt Judy was happy to see that my mom was sitting with my sister and I. That is incorrect, but people speak that way all the time. And that's why you cannot rely on the way we speak because we speak terribly when it comes to grammar. It's just, we've gotten lazy, uh, grammar has evolved, we use a more you know um, informal language with people. But the proper word here is, me and let me show you why and you can do this on the test okay me is called is the direct object the direct object happens in the predicate of the sentence okay what you can do when you have two or three things listed and you want to figure out if it's me or i take out the other 
person. So let's take out my sister. Aunt Judy was happy to see that my mom was sitting with my sister. I'm sorry. Aunt Judy was happy to see that my mom was sitting with me. You wouldn't say that my mom was sitting with I. You would say it with me. Now, if I were to put this at the front of the sentence and say something like, my sister and I were sitting with my mother and I took out my sister, I was sitting with my mother. You wouldn't say me was sitting with my mother, right? So if we were to move this to the subject and say, my sister and I were sitting with my mom, then it's part of the subject. It's a subjective pronoun and it belongs in the subject, but used here, it's a direct object. And in this case, it's used correctly. So be careful. This is no error. This sentence is just fine on its own. And let me just go over it one more time. Aunt Judy was happy to see that my mom was sitting with my sister and me. My mom was sitting with me. It all works. So be careful there. Take out the other person if you're trying to figure out whether it's I or me. And remember, direct object versus subject. They're two different things, okay? And I go over this very intensely in the online course. Also, I have a grammar playlist on my YouTube channel that goes over a lot of these different scenarios too. So if you're looking to kind of do this on the cheap and you want to save money, YouTube grammar uh, playlist, it'll help you, okay? All right, let's have a look at this one. Now, I liked this one because it's going to help me explain a couple of things, okay? This is from the study guide. I didn't put the number um, on there. It's one of the er early questions, first three or something like that. All right, the book, To Kill a Mockingbird, is part of the high school English curriculum, but many schools have banned the book. No error. Okay, so I want to talk about this part right here. The book, comma, To Kill a Mockingbird, comma. We need to locate the independent clause to make sure that the commas are used properly here, okay? The independent clause, and that is a clause that can stand on its own. It can be a sentence. The independent clause is, the book is part of the high school English curriculum. That's one independent clause. Here's the next one. Many schools have banned the book. Notice that if I were to take the book is part of the high school English curriculum, and I put a period at the end of that, it has a subject and a predicate and stand on its own, independent clause, okay? Then it says, many schools have banned the book, also independent clause, I have a subject, schools, predicate, have banned, independent clause, okay? Now this little section here is called a nominal clause, it kind of names the book, and notice it's bracketed out by commas. That means that I could essentially just cross this out and the sentence will read properly on its own. So this is actually placed properly. Those two commas bracket out that title. Now you might say, well, should there be uh, quotations around it? Shouldn't it be italicized? Not necessarily. It doesn't need that. I would probably italicize it, but that's a style issue, not a... Um, not a grammar issue. It's t it's a title, so it's capitalized, but it's um, it doesn't necessarily have to be italicized or in quotations. Now, if I were writing this in one of my books, I would italicize it. I like to use italics over quotations because quotations get really messy, but that's my own personal style, not a grammar thing. Notice that B, we take out this comma. Well, that's not going to be correct because it doesn't bracket this out and it it will read improperly there, okay? Um, and then English should be capitalized. It's a proper noun, English, Spanish, French. We're talking about a language. It should be capitalized. Now, here's the kicker. This is right here, a coordinating conjunction. These are also called fanboys. These are CC. I'm going to call it CC, coordinating conjunction. For, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. Those are all of the coordinating conjunctions. Here are the rules for coordinating conjunctions. Used on their own, they are not strong enough to separate two independent clauses. Now remember I said, the book To Kill a Mockingbird as part of the high school English curriculum is an independent clause, and many schools have banned the book is also an independent clause because it has a subject and a predicate. It can stand on its own. You have this coordinating conjunction here separating these two independent clauses. It's not enough. To separate two independent clauses, you need a comma and, comma but, 
comma yet, whichever one you're using. Okay. I don't know if you can see that because my face might be in the way. Sorry. Let me do it over here. Independent clause. You need a comma and comma, but to separate that and another independent clause. You can't just have the comma. That's a comma splice. And you can't just have the coordinating conjunction. You need them both. You need them both. And that's, I kind of talk about how it, you need strong punctuation to separate two independent clauses. You need them both. Now, if you have a dependent clause and an independent clause, a dependent and an independent, you can just use the comma or you can also use just the coordinating conjunction. Uh, let's see if I can turn this into one of those. The book, To Kill a Memory for the English. Um, let's see. But it's been banned, but banned. I'd have a hard time turning this one into that. But let me give you an example. Let's do a dependent clause. Before I went to school, comma, I brushed my teeth. I brushed my teeth is the independent clause. Before I went to school is the dependent clause. A comma alone is fine there. Here's another one. Um, I went to the store and bought a silly string and coffee. I don't need to do comma and before the coffee. There's no reason to do that. The only time I need comma and or comma but is when I have two independent clauses on both sides. All right. So there's kind of a lot of lessons just with this one sentence. The correct answer here would be uh, D. We need the comma included with the but. Okay. All right. Now let's get into the actual writing of the essay. There will be two essays on the writing portion of the exam. The first one is going to be an argumentative essay, and they're going to give you a very strongly stated assumption. So it's going to look just like this. They, they say it just like this. Argumentative essay, read the opinion stated below, and the opinion is going to be very opinionated. Here we go. The only important criterion by which to judge a prospective teacher is his or her ability to get along with students. Now notice, that's pretty bold to say the only important criterion by which to judge a prospective teacher is his or her ability to get along with students. That's, that's kind of, I mean, that's, I don't think so. I would disagree with that. And then it's going to say this, and this is always going to be the same. This will change depending on what test you get. This will not, because this is like what you're supposed to do. Discuss the extent to which you agree or disagree with this point of view. Support your position with specific reasons and examples from your own experience, observations, or reading. So here's what they want you to do. A couple things. Discuss whether you agree or disagree. Do not agree and disagree. Pick one. And then you need to support your position with specifics. You can't just make general statements like, oh, I think it's important to be more than just friendly with the students. Okay, why? For example, such as, show me, don't tell me, show me specifically. And you get to use examples from your own experience, observations, or reading. Now, this means you can use first person narrative and it's okay. Some of you are not comfortable with that. You can still use third person, but you can use I, me, we, and you can lie. Let's say you don't have a specific example. Who cares? <laughs> They're not going to go track down people in your life and see if you were lying on your practice core writing exam. Okay. You just have to support what you're saying with examples from your own experience, observations, or reading. Now, remember, we're going to decide whether we agree or disagree right off the bat. Now, I'm feeling I disagree. I'm not going to try to agree with this because it's going to be easier for me to disagree. Go with the one that's easiest and stick with it. Don't go back and forth. Well, I kind of agree and I kind of disagree. No. So let's have a look. Now, this is what I wrote for this. This is a big one. I also condensed it to here. So first thing I'm going to do is I am going to write my thesis statement or, um, you know, focus on the details. So if I go back here and I'm thinking the only important criterion by which to judge a prospective teacher is his or her own ability to get along with students. First, I'm going to say, I disagree with that. Why? Because teachers need expertise in the subject matter, biology, English, math, being friendly with students is great, but not the only thing, right? So I want to make sure that my thesis, which is, uh, 
right here, basically, I disagree with the idea that prospective teachers solely in getting along with students, it is important for teachers to be experts. This right here is pretty much my thesis. Normally, I stick it to the end of my intro paragraph, but for this, it just worked better here. And then I have, for example, a biology teacher must have detailed understanding of topics like cell division, osmosis, and photosynthesis. Notice I'm getting very specific there. Similarly, English teachers must have thorough academic uh, usage of grammar, usage, structure, composition. All right. Now, I could have just kept this and added a few more sentences and I'd be fine. But I wanted to get, I'm giving you the, the, the overachiever on this one first, and then I'm going to pare it down a little bit. Okay. Here comes my personal experience. In high school, I had an English teacher who was notorious for being difficult. I, along with others, found him abrasive and stuffy. I'm getting into this. It's a little bit much, but I'm overdoing it for you guys here. Um, we thought his style was outdated and boring. He demanded we diagram sentences, rewrite paragraphs. Notice how specific this is. Diagramming sentences, rewriting paragraphs, proofreading, okay? And then I get into, um, it turns out my English teacher had prepared me to be a successful college writer. And even though he was the least popular teacher I ever had. So notice I just supported the fact that this I disagree with because I had an English teacher who nobody liked, but he drilled us on all this content knowledge and I became a better writer because of it. That supports my thesis. And then I have a conclusion here, which you don't even need. I just put it here because it's hard for me to write an essay without an intro and a conclusion. But here's what I would say. If you're stretched for time, start here. Start with the details first. Start with the middle paragraph. Start with your experience because it's easier to write. In high school, I had an English teacher who was notorious for being difficult. He made us do this, that, and the other thing. We all hated him. He was a jerk. However, he helped me become a good reader. And that is why I disagree with the overall statement. You could just do that and you'll still grab some points. Remember, you don't need a hundred. You don't need a perfect score. You just need to grab some points. Let me show you what a pared down essay would be. And this one works just fine. Notice I say, I disagree with the idea that the prospective teachers should be judged solely on their ability to get along with students. This was the first task they asked me to do in the statement here. Discuss the extent by which you agree or disagree with this point of view. Here I've done it. Check. Now I get into why it is more important for teachers to be experts in their content area. Now that's kind of a general statement. Now we need to get more specific. We always have to dig down and get specific. Here we go. Now I'm showing you, I'm not telling you, you can visualize this. In high school, I had an English teacher who was notorious for being difficult, blah, blah, blah. We found his teaching style to be outdated. However, during my freshman year of college, I quickly realized because of his approach, my knowledge of grammar, punctuation, blah, 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 made me better. Turns out he was prepared me to be a successful college writer. And then I just have a little ending. Although it's helpful for a teacher to be well-liked, that's not the only quality that makes a teacher effective. Did I do everything? Yes, I did. I told you I disagreed. Then I gave you specifics from a personal experience that supports why I disagree. I got very specific and showed you. I gave you examples of exactly what I'm talking about. And then I gave a little ending statement. This would be perfectly fine and you would gain probably full points from that. Okay, so you can go intro, conclusion, all that, or you can just keep it simple. All right, and I'll send out this, um, I'll send out these two things. I'll send, I'll send this out to the email when, that you guys get. All right, let's have a look. And I didn't project it on my screen here. Let's have a look at the source-based essay. Okay. The source-based essay is going to look like this and it's going to be long and it's going to look more complicated than the argumentative essay, but it's really not. It's actually easier because all you're doing is summarizing two people's arguments, way easier than making up your own argument. Okay. So it says here, here's your source best essay. Here is, and it's always going to be like this. You're going to have this statement, just a general statement about the subject that the source based essay is about. Then you, this is going to be the same. This bold right here is going to be the same across all tests. And then you're going to have source one and source two. Okay. Don't worry. I'm going to paraphrase all of this for you. I'm not going to read this all to you. Okay. So Let's first just read this part here and I'll just zoom in really quick. Okay, hopefully you can see that really good. Artificial intelligence, AI is progressing rapidly. While science fiction often portrays AI as, as robots and human-like characteristics, AI can encompass anything from Google search algorithms to autonomous weapons. Many people believe that AI is not malevolent or 
because it is not likely to exhibit human emotions. However, others fear that AI will become conscious and destroy us, or it will land in the wrong hands and be used for evil purposes. Both of the following sources address whether or not AI could be harmful to our society. All right. Typically, not all the time, you have two um, uh, differing opinions. You'll have somebody who says AI is good and someone who says AI is bad. You might have someone who says uh, cell phones in schools are good. Another person says cell phones in schools are bad. Now, sometimes you'll get one where they both are agreeing, but they're agreeing for different reasons. So you just have to adapt your writing. If you get two that are agreeing, you just say, well, source one says it's good because of X, Y, Z. While source two agrees that it's good, it thinks it's good for a different reason. You can still find differences between the two, all right? Now for this, I chose two sources that disagree about our artificial intelligence, okay? Then what they'll give you is an actual source with like a citation. So in 2018, Mar B wrote this, artificial intelligence, six AI risks everyone should know about. So right away, when I look at the source, I know this is a disagree. They don't like AI, right? I'm going to scroll down real quick. Look at source two. Remember, I'm thinking like a test maker. I'm not reading the whole first source. I'm not reading the whole second source. I'm figuring out, do they disagree? AI, a force for good. MIT Tech Review, 2018. Okay, right away I know the, uh, what was his name again? Sorry, let me go up here. Sorry, this is Mar B says AI is risky and MIT says it's good. Okay. Now let me show you how I'm going to map this. Move this over here. Here we go. Here's my map. I got bad and I got good. Keep it simple. Use your uh, little scratch sheet. Okay. AI is bad. AI is good. Now, do I have to read the entire thing? No, I do not. Please do not. Let me go back. Do not read this entire thing. This is going to take you forever. Pick out a couple of things that stand out to you that you can use as an example. Two, there's probably um, several things that you could use here as an example. All right. Just grab two. So you can see this is all fluff. Oh, AI can be dangerous since recent developments, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Here we go. Um, autonomous weapons, bad. And then they give examples. Okay. This one here is machines can track, analyze, and uh, invade our privacy. Boom. Okay. Perfect. Guess what? On my AI is bad, I got autonomous weapons and tracking. There we go. And then I have one little piece of specific detail and one little piece of specific detail. Okay. Same with the MIT article. Now we're going to good. Let me go back. Okay. It's good. Okay. It's democratized stuff. Uh, it off underserved segments of the population. How, uh, let's see. AI can understand patterns based on the apps people use. Um, they can help them more, uh, be more accurate. All right. Educators can use it. AI programs can imp improve student outcomes. Okay. I know about that. Student outcomes is good. Uh, tailor-made curriculum. Okay. There's a little, you know, it can improve student outcomes. Tailor-made curriculum is a specific detail. All right. Ooh, look at this. Healthcare, hospitals. Okay. Let's go down here. Uh, pre Pre-diagnosis. There's a specific detail. I don't have to get into all the minutia in here. I just need to pick out two things. You start reading this whole thing, you're filling your brain up with stuff you don't need and you're wasting time. Okay. So I've got my, I went in, I skimmed and I found that MIT uh, article is good because learning and medical. And then I got the two little or one for each, one specific detail for learning and one specific detail for medical. And I did the same thing for AI is bad. One thing I might wanna put on my map, which I didn't hear now that I'm thinking about that, uh, this is 2018. And this one is, um, are they both 2018? Both 2018. Okay, they're both 2018. All right. I want to make sure I have that um, when I'm citing. Okay. 
So let's go back. So I got my quick map here. Now I'm going to turn it into something. Let's have a look. This is why you must write the detailed paragraphs first, because all the information is in the detailed paragraphs. And if you run out of time, you've got this and that's fine. You're going to get more points. If you start with the intro and you end up spending 15 minutes on the intro and that's all you get, you're not going to get to all this stuff. Okay. So I recommend writing the details first. Well, what's the details on the source base? I'm just going to summarize Mar. And then the next paragraph, I'm going to summarize MIT. Remember Mar is bad. MIT is good. Okay. And here we go. Mar asserts that AI can be dangerous. And notice that I just used the last name of the author and the date. Nowhere in the statements does it say it has to be APA, MLA, Chicago style. Just, I use APA because it's easiest. APA is last name and date. Don't use any direct quotes. Don't make it more complicated. Just summarize what they say and throw in a couple of citations here and there. Okay? You do not have to, they just want to know that you're using the articles. Okay? So I got Mar 2018 asserts AI can be dangerous, um, blah, blah, blah. He argues that AI can become autonomous weapons. Remember, that was one of my bad things. And develop a mind of their own, which puts uh, citizens in danger. In addition, states that AI can be used to collect, track, and analyze people, which puts them in danger. And then I get specific, for example, face recognition cameras, algorithms can be used to oppress citizens. And then I go on a little bit more. So just take pieces of the article, put it in and add Mar 2018 at the beginning or end and we're good. You got it. Let's go to here. MIT. MIT released an article in 2018. That is a citation. You're telling me that we're about to summarize that. That praises AI and outlines ways it can be used as an effective tool. Um, and here we go. One way it can positively uh, affect people is in student outcomes. For example, this tells your reader, the grader, I'm about to give you a specific example. And then I do. AI can differentiate learning or tailor curriculum. And then it says, uh, MIT 2018 shows how AI can be used in hospitals. Remember, we said healthcare to improve patient outcomes. And then I give you a specific example. It's used to collect advanced patient information for pre-diagnosis. That was all in my map. This was all in my map. All I did was expand on it. Okay. Then if you want, and if you have time, you could add an intro and add a conclusion, but you don't need it. Let's say the clock is ticking. You're about to, it's about to be done. And you're like, oh my God, just throw in artificial intelligence is, is advancing rapidly. The debate, you could do another one. There's a debate out there. People agree or disagree on it. And then you could put in a conclusion, the benefits and concerns around AI are just heating up, blah, blah, blah. This is fluff. This is fluff and so is this. You're being graded on this, okay? So do this part first. That way you have it written down and if, it's, if it shuts down because you ran out of time, you at least have that in there and you're gonna get all or some points. All right, let's have a look at a um, condensed version. All I did was take the debate, look at this last sentence. I took my thesis sentence. The debate about AI being a tool for good or dangerous weapon is ongoing. I just put that here. The debate about AI being a tool for good or a dangerous weapon is ongoing. And here I go. Mar asserts that AI can be dangerous and the time is now to determine how dangerous this technology could be. Mar argues AI can be used as autonomous weapons. I got specific. I said it's dangerous, general, autonomous weapons, specific. Mar states that AI can be used to collect, track, and analyze people. General, using face recognition cameras. Specific. All right, now I go into MIT. Conversely, MIT released an article in 2018, another citation, that praises AI can be used effectively to improve citizens' lives. General, here we go with specific, can be used in some hospitals to improve patient outcomes. Specific. Here we get more specific. For example, AI collects advanced patient data, da, da, da. And then I grabbed a little concluding sentence. As AI is integrated into people's lives, people must decide whether the, uh, to weigh the pros and the cons, whether the pros outweigh the cons. You could submit this. You probably get full points. It is a little short, but it doesn't matter. You did everything they asked. What did they say in the question? Let's go back up uh, here. Wait, no. Oh, let me go to... I don't have it. Let's see. Do I have it? 
No, I've got to go over here. Sorry. Okay. It says, read the two passages carefully and write an essay in which you identify the most important concerns regarding the issue. Explain why they are important. Your essay must draw on both from both the sources. In addition, uh, use your own experiences if you want. You may, you don't have to, you may draw on your own experiences. You do not have to. Be sure to cite the sources. Well, guess what? This condensed version, which is right here, does all of that. Does all of that. You would get uh, close to full points just for this one paragraph. You could also break it up into two, like I did before. It just depends. There is no specific way. How many paragraphs do I have to write? How many words does it have to be? They don't say that. It's not anywhere in the rubric. They want you to complete what they're asking. Okay. All right. Let me stop share and go out. Now we're going to work on math, but I just want to check in and see how you guys are doing. Oh my God. It's so hot in my office. I'm dying. Okay. Tamika's asking, is there a word limit max for each answer? No, they never say. I say, keep it short. Here's what I notice a lot of people do when they're struggling with the writing. I have a lot of very proficient writers who are upset because they say, I'm a great writer and I can't pass the writing. I don't understand what's going on. Nine times out of 10, you're doing too much. You're doing too much. You're answering it too long. You're going around the world to describe one thing. Be direct. Go through the task at hand and just complete the tasks. Don't do any more than that. Okay. How long should the essay be? Doesn't matter. Okay. All right. Let's just scroll down. Now. Do you need more than one body paragraph as a response? You don't. I've seen samples from ETS for many different constructed responses where it's one paragraph and it gets full points. You just have to make sure you do everything they say. And remember, general, then specific. Give me a general statement and then say, for example, this is a very good formula to use when you're writing for something like this. You, you state something general. Oh, teachers need more than just to be friends with kids or whatever it said, right? Teachers should be more than just friendly. They need to have skills. For example, biology teachers need to understand cell division. Notice I got specific. So it's a very good um, kind of formula to use when you're writing, especially to this. Go general, give me a specific, for example. Do another general statement, for example, and do that as you go and you will get those points. Specificity is one of the things I see people's essays missing the most. They write a four paragraph essay and they never gave me an example. They just talked in generalities the whole time. Use that for example, such as those types of things and it'll make you uh, add an example. It'll make you do it, okay? All right, let's do math. All right, so let's see, eight, nine. Okay, I'm starting with number eight in math. Let me share screen. Okay, all right, get my calculator out. I hate doing math live because I always make mistakes. And then people write in the YouTube comments, you made a mistake. I'm like, yes, I know, I make mistakes, okay? I make mistakes. Also with the math, I'm going to do it kind of the long way. I'm going to show you some shortcuts, but I'm going to explain the math. And this gets people too. like when I do math on TikTok, they say, you could have just done this. I am aware there are some major shortcuts that people who are very good at math can do. But most people who come to me are struggling in math. So I want to show you why. All right. And it'll help you to do it. Now, there are, there's always a shortcut, and I'm going to show you a few shortcuts today. But I want to show you why things are the way they are because it'll help you, all right? So we're at number eight right now. I'm going to skip the number sense questions in the study guide because those are the easiest. I want to get to like the proportions and some of the more complex stuff today with people. All right, eight. A model of a statue measures eight inches wide and six inches tall. The scale of inches to feet used to make the statue is a ratio, keyword here, ratio of two to five. Inches to feet is two to five. Inches to feet. Inches to feet. It doesn't matter which way you write it. It's a ratio. This should be lowercase. Sorry. Somebody will yell. That I should be lowercase. Okay. Hang on. There we go. Okay. Inches to feet inches to feet. We're actually going to use this because when we do a proportion, it's easier to do it with a, with a fraction like that. Okay. But a ratio is a fraction inches to feet. 
Top is inches, bottom is feet, okay? What is the height of the actual statue? Now, there's a couple things they're doing here. We got to use a proportion. And they're giving you extra info here. They're giving you the width. I don't want the width. I want the height. That's here, six inches tall. So I'm talking about inches to feet. Well, let's convert this. For this scale, and this is called uh, a scale uh, proportion, it is two inches for every five feet. So on the, on the uh, model, it's two inches, but on the actual, you know, the actual statue is five feet. So every two inches high, it's actually five feet high. Okay. We're going to make this equal six inches, but I don't have the feet, do I? I only know the inches on the model. It doesn't say I have six inches and then this many feet. So because I don't have this fourth thing here, I'm going to use X. All right. This is one of the things I want you to think about when we're doing proportions. First of all, if it says ratio, you can do a proportion. I love proportions. You can solve math using proportions for a lot of different things, okay? What you're doing is you're making it matchy-matchy. Inches over feet equals inches over feet. You could do feet over inches equals feet over inches, but whatever's on the top has to be the same on both sides. If you mix them up, you're going to get a different answer, okay? Now all you do is cross, multiply, and solve. 2 times x is 2x equals 5 times 6 is 30. Divide by 2 to solve for x. Divide by 2. x equals 15. The actual height is 15 feet. So notice what I did. I got rid of the eight inches wide because we're not looking at width. We're looking at height. I used the ratio two inches to five feet. Inches over feet equals inches over feet. I know the inches, six, but I don't know the feet. That's what I'm looking for. That's the X. When I set it up as a proportion, cross, multiply, and solve, I get 15 feet. Okay? All right. There's going to be another proportion too, so don't worry. Let's go to this one. All right. 64, and I sh this should say out of, I feel like of 30, uh, 320 is confusing because of means to multiply. So I apologize for that. But I mean, it could stay this way. It doesn't matter. But um, I would probably, if I were going to reword this free study guide, I would say out of. 64 out of 320 teachers in a district responded that they wanted to work on a Saturday before school started so that they could trade that day for a duty day during the school year. If there are 6,420 teachers in the district, predict how many teachers in the district want to work on a Saturday. Okay. So we have 64 out of 320. Part over whole. 64 out of 320. 64 want to work the extra day. All right. So the way I'm going to do this matchy-matchy is, let me just make up something want to work over total equals want to work over total. Well, I don't know how many want to work, but I know the total number of teachers, 64. I don't need a comma there. Sorry. 64, 20 is the total. I don't know how many want to work out of all of that. We just did a little sample here. This is a sample. We didn't survey every single one of them. We surveyed 320, and out of 320, 64 want to work. So if I were to make that a proportion to figure out how many total teachers want to work, I have the total here, and I need to figure out how many want to work. Let me just erase this so you're not, let me do this so it's on both sides. This will be better. Want to work over total. Uh, we don't know how many want to work, and the total is 6420. Okay, now I'm going to cross multiply and solve. This is why you need your calculator and you do get an on-screen calculator for this. So we're going to multiply 6420 by 64. 6420 times 64. And that equals um, 410880. And then we're going to multiply 320 by X. 3, 
20x. Set them equal. Set them equal. I'm going to move it up here. 320x equals 410880. Okay. Now we have to isolate the x. We got to figure out we need this. How many out of the whole school want to work? Divide by 320. Cancels. Divide by 320. Now you might be, oh, it's a big number. Yeah, but usually when you do this on the math test, they come out even Stephen, and it does. 1284. That's how many total. So we had this little sample size here. We surveyed these teachers and 64 out of the 320 said they wanted to work that extra day so they could get a day off later. Now I need to apply that to the whole district. I didn't survey the whole district. So the way I do that is I set it equal to one another, do a proportion, matchy, matchy. Want to work over total equals want to work over total. Notice we don't know what the want to work over the, the, the whole district is. We only know from the sample size. That's how you do that. Okay. Now be careful. One thing I want to show you about this. Sometimes they might say, oops. Sometimes they might say they'll trick you. So be on the lookout, read the last sentence closely. If there are 6,420 teachers in the district, predict how many teachers in the district want to work on a Saturday. They might have said, predict how many teachers do not want to work. This is a thing they do on math tests. And you start cross multiplying and you're doing your thing. And all of a sudden you get your 1284 and you're like, boom, 1284. And if it's a multiple choice, 1284 will be in the answer choices as well because they're going to anticipate your wrong answer. But this is how many people want to work. We need how many people do not want to work. So in order to get this correct, if it were worded that way, it's not, but I'm just saying if it were, you would have to take 6420 and subtract 11284. There would be an additional step. So just make sure you read the, the question stem carefully. And when you have this type of thing where you've got this proportion and you're figuring out a total or whatever, make sure it's the right group that you're attaching this answer to. It's just a word to the wise. I see this all the time and they will have the correct, the incorrect answer in the answer choices because they're really good at writing these tests and they anticipate your wrong answers. Okay. All right. So those were two proportion questions you can use. There are shortcuts to these, but I prefer just to put out the proportion because it make I make sure everything's matchy matchy. If you're struggling with math, I wouldn't go any sh quicker than this. This one's hard. You're predicting. They might have it with um, animals. It might say this is a similar thing. It might say something like, uh, "We we went to a we went out on a fishing expedition, and we caught out of the 320 fish we caught, 64 of them were grouper." Okay. Um, then we went out, you know, again, and uh, we caught another thing and, and it's a bigger sample size, right? How many would be grouper? So let's say I go out again and I, I, uh, I, I catch 850. Okay. Based on this, what would my prediction be of how many grouper I'm going to catch that day? Do you see what I'm saying? It's a prediction. It's not going to be exact, but we're setting up a portion, a proportion to predict. Okay. All right. Let's have a look at this scatter plot. This tends to give people agita because we're looking at a graph and we're looking at um, slope intercept. Okay. So it says here, which of the following could be the line of best fit for the data about the weight of books in a shipment for the scatter plot. All right, first thing I want you to do is I want you to take a look at your X and Y, um, your X and Y axis, okay? So X is here, it's going this way, and Y is here, it's going up and down, right? Just like on a coordinate plane. Notice, be careful, these go in twos. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, 10, 12. And these go by ones, one, two, three, four, five. And it's even kind of more crazy because these look like it's a bigger space in between each one. And these are smaller spaces, but it's still two. So just pay attention to the X and Y axis. 
access, it's very important because sometimes they like to, they like to trick you on that. So right away, I'm going to look at this and just do a quick assessment X and Y. All right, we're going up two, and the other one is going over one. All right. I'm just zooming in a little bit so that we can see it a little bit better here. Okay. Now let's have a look at the answer choices. I noticed that we are in slope intercept form. Okay. So y equals mx plus b. That's what's happening here. And slope is m. So this two is the slope. This negative two is the slope. This one half is the slope. This one half is the slope. And this negative one half is the slope. Okay. So really quickly, when we have negative slopes or positive slopes, we can start to eliminate right away, which helps get our, um, helps make our, uh, probability of passing even better. This slope is going up. This is a positive slope. So I can eliminate B and E because they're negative. Okay. If the lines, if these dots were going like this, that's a negative slope. The line is coming down like that. Then I would eliminate the positives, but it's not, it's going up. So we're going to eliminate the negatives right away. And you can see that it's already giving me, it got rid of two answer choices right there. Okay. Now what I would do is I would just use rise over run. Okay. Rise over run. Now this two is actually two over one. And this one half is one over two. So I'm going to decide whether two over one or one over two is the right slope. Okay. So rise is this two run is the one rise is up run is over. Okay. So let's just see what happens when I go up to, so I'm going to start right here. I'm going to go up two over one, 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 two over one, two over one, two over one, two over one. Notice this one is right there. This one lines up real nice with those dots. Okay. A looks like it's my first place winner here, but let's just see, let's try the one half. And I have two one halves here. Okay. Let's try up one over two. Now be careful. Remember this is going by twos. So up one is in the, is in the middle right here. Up one over two, up one over two, up one over two, up one over two, up one over two over two. Notice this one is way uh, less steep. That one does not line up. So I can cross off those one halves right there, leaving me with A as the correct answer. So there's a couple things going on. Now, listen, if you are like, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. Who cares? Don't do it. Just eliminate the negative slopes and then grab the one you think might be the one. Because I would hate for you to spend 18 minutes on this and miss a bunch of math problems that you could have gotten correct. So do your best. If it's a positive line like this, only choose a positive slope. If it's a negative, then choose a negative slope right there. It's going to increase your chances of getting it correct. And then just eyeball it, do your best. You know, some of these you're not going to get, and that's okay. Click it and move on and don't overthink it because if you spend too much time on this, you could ruin your chances with the other things. You know what I mean? And we want to get as many correct as we can. All right, let's go here. This one tends to be difficult for people too. A paper bag contains six red squares, some yellow squares, and eight blue squares. If the probability of selecting a yellow square is five out of 12, how many yellow squares are in the bag? Okay, probability. Probability. It's going to be a fraction or a ratio. Probability. And probability is part over whole. I want you to remember that. Part over whole. Now, let's have a look at the total. So we have this, we have this ratio here or this probability, which is five over 12. That's yellow over whole, yellow over whole. Okay. So we're going to set that equal. Do we know how many yellow squares we have? No. So we're going to indicate that with a W. 
I'm sorry, that is a Y. Indicate it with a Y. Now I need the hole. Well, what's the hole here? The hole is six plus eight plus uh, Y, right? Six red, eight blue, and the yellow. So that's 14 plus Y, not 14 Y, 14 plus Y, okay? So let me go ahead and convert that. 14 plus Y, still using a proportion. Notice this is part over whole. We have yellow over all of them. We have six and eight, 14 plus some yellow. That's the whole shebang. That's everything in the bag. I'm just looking for yellow. And I have the probability of yellow here, okay? But I need how many yellow squares? This five out of 12 is a reduction, is a, re a reduced fraction, obviously, because the denominator is 12 and we have over 14 in the, in the real bag, okay? Same thing as before, cross multiply and solve, all right? So we have 12y equals, now let's five times 14 plus y. We're going to distribute five times 14, is 70 plus 5y, okay? Now, I wanna get all the y's on one side. I'm gonna subtract 5y here, subtract 5y. This becomes 7y equals 70. Notice how it's kinda of lining up. When you have uh, math problems like this, notice the answer choices are all normal numbers. There's no decimals and things like that. If you start getting a decimal, you know you've done something wrong here, okay? And if I were to divide by seven, divide by seven, y equals 10, d. So there's a couple things going on here. First is probability. You also have a proportion and you also have algebra. This, um, this one assesses a lot of different skills, okay? All right, let's go on to the next one. Okay, choose all of the following that are equivalent to the expression 4a squared. All right, so they're trying to figure out if you can understand like terms and things like that, all right? Let's have a look at this first one here. 2a plus 2a, that is not 4a squared, that equals 4a. I have two a's and they add another two a's, I have 4a. That is not 4a squared, so that is not our answer. 4a times a, a times a is 4a squared. Yes, the second one is, is correct, okay? Let's look at this third one. 6a to the third minus 2a. You might be tempted to go, oh, that's 4a squared. No, it's not. This subtraction means you have to have like terms. This is actually reduced as far as it can go. 6a to the third minus 2a, you can't reduce that anymore because the exponents have to match when you are doing a um, adding or subtracting, okay? So it's not that one. We're gonna cross that one out. Nope. Okay, now let's have a look at this one here. I'm just gonna make it a little bigger. Eight, eight A to the fourth, two A squared. Okay, I'm gonna divide eight by two and I get four. Now, when we divide exponents, we're actually subtracting them. This is really, a to the fourth minus two. And this becomes 4a squared. So this one, yes. Oops, darn it, sorry. Needed to check mark it. Yes, actually I'm gonna circle the ones. Yes and yes. And then let's have a look here. 3a squared plus a squared. Notice I have matching exponents here. Yes, I do. And this is really a 1a. Three plus one is four a squared. We have to keep the a squared because we're adding here. Yes, so the second one, the fourth one, and the fifth one, two, four, and five are correct. All right, let's have a look at number 15. Now this is one where we can work backwards and we don't even have to solve anything, okay? When you see inequalities here like this, slow down. I want you to eliminate before you do anything, all right? So let's have a look at the question. If a shirt costs $30 and pants cost 48, 
and John has 300 to spend, which answer choice represents how many shirts and pants he can buy? How much does he have to spend? 300. Can he spend more than 300? No, he has 300. So anything that has a greater than sign, this greater than 300 is out right away. Anything greater than 300 is out. You can't spend more than 300. Now, can we spend 300? Yes. Can we spend less than 300? Yes. So that means we need a less than or equal than sign. And there's only one B. That's all you have to do. You don't need to get uh, turned around and all the other stuff. Just go straight to the answer choices and look at those inequalities and figure out a lot of times. And they do this a lot. There's only one correct answer and you can just get it by eliminating. Okay. And the last one, this one's kind of tough. This one's geometry. Okay. We're looking at lines here. All right. If A and B are parallel, if lines A and B are parallel, what is the value of X in the figure below? All right. So there's a couple ways to do this. First, we want to talk about complementary and supplementary angles. Complementary angles, I'm going to call them CA equal 90 degrees. Supplementary angles, SA equal 180 degrees. Also, a triangle equals 180 degrees. That's going to help you figure this out. Okay. So we have an angle measure here. We have some information about the triangle. You're always going to have enough information to figure this out. I'm going to zero in on the triangle because that's easy for me. If the triangle right here equals 180, 90 plus 40 is 130. 180 minus 130 is 50. I know this angle here is 50. Okay. Now, complementary angles, this angle plus this angle equals 90. I also know this because it's there. So this little angle here is 40. Well, guess what? Vertical angles are also equal. Equal. This and this are equal. This one and this one. And this one and this one are equal. So let me go ahead and erase that so I have somewhere to go. This x plus 10 equals this angle here, 40 minus 10 minus 10, x equals 30. The answer is 30. Now let's try it another way because there's going to be some times where you get other information. Let's just do, do it a different way too, okay? Let me just erase all this. Okay, let's say I want to figure out this angle here because if I do, I can figure out the x here, all right? Well, that's easy. 40 and this angle right here together are supplementary angles. They equal 180. So 40 plus what equals 180? 140. That's 140 right here. So that means this is 140 here. Well, guess what? X plus 10 plus 140 equal, equal 180 because this whole thing, this line is 180. So we added up X plus 150 equals 180 minus 150 minus 150 X equals 30 same way. There's a lot of different ways you could do it. it. Just depends on what you're more comfortable with. I like to focus in on the triangle because then I know what's up. All right. Let me just be done with this. Let me go here. Let me stop sharing. Okay. All right. So, um, Kim, which one are you lost on? Let me know in your comments and I will, um, redo it. So let me know which one you were lost on. Okay. All right. So, um, that concludes the webinar. And if you guys have any questions about the math and you, um, and you want to know more on that, let me know. I'll redo somebody saying they're having a hard time. Uh, Kim is saying she's lost. So if you're lost, let me know which number and I'll go back and redo it for you. Okay. All right. So that concludes, um, complementary and supplementary. Okay. Let me go back. She got back to me. Hang on. Okay. Let me go here. Uh, share screen. Let me, let me go over that one more time. And I highly recommend you look them up. It's easy. Like just look online, but, um, okay, let's go back here. Okay. Let me erase this so we can just focus on complementary and supplementary angles. Okay. All right, one more time. 
when we're talking about angles and lines, there are a couple things you want to know. First of all, a straight line equals 180 degrees. This right here is 180 degrees. When I add angles to it, these change, but together they equal 180. Even if I had a line like this, uh, angle one, angle two, and angle three all equal 180 because they're against this line here, right? When you're using a line like this, a straight line, those are supplementary and it's going to equal 180. And it's easy to see. Notice we have X plus 10 here plus this equals 180 because it's a line. All right. So that's a supplementary angle. Complementary angles equal 90. So this little degree and this little degree, those are complementary angles and they equal 90. Now, most of the time, there will be this little box here that indicates it's a right angle. Not You have to have that to indicate it's a right angle. Now, I know it's a right angle because this says 90 and A and B are um, parallel. So this one also has to be 90 as well. But most of the time, they'll put that little box in there that shows you that it's a 90 degree angle. All right. So notice. If I were to use this triangle, triangles equal 180 degrees also. All the angles on the inside of the triangle equal 180. So 90 plus 40 is 130. And 180 minus 130 is 50. So this angle inside that triangle is 50. Well, if complementary angles equal 90, then this angle right here is 40 because 40 plus 50 equals 90. Okay? Now... Vertical angles are also equal. Let me show you that. Because you have to know all this in order to get this question correct. Vertical angles, like this angle and this angle, those are equal. Think about it. If you had two sticks and you were going like this, when you move them back and forth, these angles close and open at the same rate. So these two are equal, and subsequently, this angle and this angle are equal. Those are called vertical angles. So if I figured out that this 40 is this angle, well, this 40 and this x plus 10 are equal. x plus 10 equals 40, because vertical angles are equal. So what I used there was complementary angles, because I knew that this equals 90, and here's 50. 50 plus what equals 90? 40. Okay. And then I know vertical angles are equal. X plus 10 is equal to 40. And then I just solve it like a normal algebraic equation, or you could just figure it out. X, what plus 10 equals 40? Well, 30 plus 10 equals 40. Okay. It can be difficult. Uh, the geometry part is hard, but nine times out of 10, they're going to give you some hints in here to help you. There's a couple different ways to get this answer. Okay. All right. Hope that helped. Okay, so I'm so glad you guys learned a lot. Awesome. I know it's a long one. Today I went over. It's an hour and a half. This is a bigger test, okay? All right, let me show you where we get some more free resources, especially those of you who are having trouble with math. First of all, I highly recommend the online math course, okay? So if you want that, there's an offer code. We put it in the chat. We're, we're also going to send it to you in an email. Give us about 30 minutes. Um, once this webinar is over, we send out the email. So you'll get it. Um, let's go ahead and take a look really quickly one more time with uh, free resources. Let me just show you my YouTube channel really quickly. Um, so I got all the stuff and especially if you guys are looking for other things, like some of you have to take the teaching reading. I have so many videos on that. Um, and then I have my math playlist here. There's so much here. This is just a few of them. Okay. Oh my God, that thumbnail. Oh my God. Look at those thumbnails. We need to change those. <laughs> um, and writing, I've got playlists there. So there's so much here for you to for you to do. Now, one other thing that I've got going on that I'm really excited about, I have new audio courses. Um, right now, I only have the SLLA 6990 and the 5412, and I just launched this Praxis, Praxis Teaching Reading audio course. The audio courses people really like, it's me talking to you and kind of walking you through it. They are best for the subject area exams. I don't have an audio course for the Praxis Core because you have to like do 
the stuff. You can't just talk through it. You got to actually do it. But if you're interested in audio courses, I'm, I'm going to be adding a bunch. So I got the Praxis Teaching Reading ready to go, the SLLA 6990 and the 5412. I'm about to add ESOL and a few others. So that's, that's really helpful. Remember, I have more free webinars on our free webinars tab. Next week, I'm doing ESOL. The week after, it's uh, elementary ed. I also have I just did special ed, PLT. Go to this webinars page and we'll link it up in the email for you to get there. Um, I also have some lesson planning webinars and things like that that would be very helpful for you. YouTube, uh, Facebook, I had tons of uh, people on Facebook. Um, let's see here. Facebook, lots of different things we share on Facebook. TikTok, Instagram, I am everywhere. Um, hopefully you guys can find me on social media. If you have any questions, just email us at info at kathleenjasper.com and it'll be our pleasure to help. It was awesome working with you guys here today. I know it's a Saturday and you're probably fried and you want to just chill, but I'm really happy that you took this, uh, this time to work on your skills. Let us know how things are going. And um, again, we've got ESOL next weekend on the 8th. No, the 9th. What is today? The 2nd? Let me look real quick. ESOL is on the 9th. So it's next Saturday. So if you're looking for ESOL, um, English speakers of other languages. So if you're looking to get that certification and that will help you with all kinds of different exams. All right. So you guys have been awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Be on the lookout for that email and I'll talk to you later. Bye.